Jesus said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on the lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so your light must shine before others that they may see your good do deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. Hello and welcome to Close to Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father By, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. You are the salt of the earth. I'm not talking about the box that we get at the supermarket, but one of the things that we don't really realize is in the early days, in the time of our Lord, salt was a commodity that was highly sought after because of its value in food. And so when you say things like, and we've heard it growing up, you know, are they worth their salt? No, those people aren't worth their salt. Meaning that we paid a lot for it and the dividends on it were very little. Salt was a commodity that was very much sought after and in the day of our Lord, very expensive. And so when our Lord calls someone, you're the salt of the earth. You're the one. You're the one that gives flavor. You're the one that adds meaning. You're the one that shows the glory and the power of God. I ask you to think about this. You know, early on, years ago, little kids, Baltimore Catechism, who made me? God made me. Why did God make me? To know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world and be happy with him in the next. Those were the first two questions that we ever learned in the Baltimore Catechism. Do you really think that that reality is still in force? Even with people with so-called religion and or faith, why do they think they're here? What's their purpose of being here? Is it like the beer commercial? You only go around once and grab for all the gusto? Or is it in reality we're here to show our love for God? Think about this. Those of you who've had children, who got to that age, mom, dad, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know if I want to go to college. I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know if I want to do that. And then they make a suggestion and they say something like, you know, I really like poetry. I'd like to study poetry. Poetry? How are you going to live off poetry? How much poetry can you eat? How much poetry is going to pay your light bill? How much poetry? You know, And we go on and on. And inadvertently, Oftentimes, within the family context, the children are given a definition that you will be successful when you earn this much money, you live in this type of neighborhood, you're able to send my grandchildren to this type of school. And if you look at modern society, and you look at the children of the rich and famous, and you look at the children who were born with the proverbial silver spoon in their mouth, and then you look at their lives. 
And you say, how tragic. How sad. How many people have made it to the top? They can call whatever amount they want to, to work, acting, singing, whatever they want. They're famous. Everybody knows them. So why did they freebase cocaine before going into a treatment program and kill themselves in the parking lot? Why does that happen? Why is it that all the fame, all the fortune, all the riches, all the power, all the praise doesn't provide for them what they really want? Why do they need something else to enjoy life or to find meaning or to find purpose? Not long ago, I had a day where I had two fentanyl funerals in the same day. That was followed up by a funeral where the person surrendered their own lives. Whenever we read through the obituaries and we see some young person and the family said they were so warm, they were so loving, they enjoyed life, they, every, you know, they lit up a room and they came in, they brought so much joy to people, this, that, and the other. And then you realize that they forfeited their own lives, they're overdosed. What's missing? What's missing in the lives of the next generation and some in our own generation, what's missing that they can only find, I, I, it can't be meaning. You know, living stoned all the time can't be that, that you find meaning. But what's missing in the fundamentals of their life that they have to find something else to... I, I, I'm not sure, a feeling, a buzz, a high, whatever, what's missing? And you know, I find that today a lot more prevalent. Maybe it's because I'm in the business of burying people. Maybe it's because I'm the one that gets a phone call. They really don't say in the newspaper what happened. But when they call the priest to prepare for the funeral, they tell us, you know, and they tell us about these wonderful children and they say stuff like, they just had this demon. They were such good people. They loved us so much. They enjoyed us so much. They brought us so much happiness. But they couldn't get rid of this demon. And it was just got bigger than they were. And then this happened, that happened, and here we are. We're preparing to bury our loved one. And I think that fundamental question that we have eliminated from our thought process, our religious process, our education about God, I think that fundamental question that we have eliminated has caused a generation to think it's all about just being happy and being as happy as I can and being as happy I can for as long as I can. And then that, that, that happiness wears off and you got to do it again. And then when you look at all this stuff that's coming across the border and in my own mind, it's a criminal offense that we're not policing that any better. But with that being said, why is there such a restlessness and an emptiness when the only thing you're doing is seeking out for yourself as much pleasure as you can possibly handle? And I think that's fundamental. I think that's fundamental to the society that we live in. And parents, I'm getting ready to come down and I'm come down hard. You know, for you to raise a child, to think that that child can have whatever they want, and for you to raise a child to think that their acts have no consequences, 
for you to raise a child to think that they're going to live in a world where they're always safe. And for you to raise a child where in the mindsets of many people, as young as four and five, they get to choose something as innate as their gender. But then we say at 18 or 19 years old, when they took out a student loan, they were not smart enough to realize how much debt they were going into. But at four or five, if they want to be another gender, we're going to support that to show them that we love them. Stop. Stop. Teach your children that life has many joys and many sorrows. Teach your children that it's not all about me. Teach your children that when we're able, when we're able to bring joy into the world for other people, when we're able to make a difference in other people's lives, when we're able to face the consequences of our own actions and learn from them, then we're going to understand what God is all about. When we have these parents who helicopter their children, they're always hovering over on top of them to make sure that they're safe. My brother owned some, some rental property. He had a young man, 27 years old, who wanted to get his master's in business. And he came to rent one of my brother's apartments. And when he said he really liked it, he wanted to have it, my brother said, okay, are you ready to sign whatever? Oh, no. My mom has to come first and see where I'm living and make sure she can find a maid to come two days a week to take care of my apartment. At 27 years old, I was in my second parish as a priest. And this guy still got his mother changing his diapers and hovering over him. And you wonder why? If their candidate doesn't win the election, we need to provide hot chocolate and therapy dogs and call off exams and make sure everyone feels safe? Do you really wonder about that? Or when Northern Virginia, they have a pro-life luncheon schedule somewhere, and an hour and a half before, the entire wait staff says, we don't feel safe serving salad to someone who's pro-life. So they had to cancel the event because they were scared, because their wait staff didn't feel safe, safe among people who value human life. No wonder the salt has lost its flavor. No wonder the salt is no longer good for anything but, be but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. We're not teaching the next generation how to be the salt of the earth and enrich the earth and enrich the community in which they live. We're teaching them that it's all about you and what a miserable life that will be. Stay with us, we'll be back in a moment. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today and a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need and also your financial support. We are donor driven and that is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply, and mainstream media is not going to bring you the truth of the Gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly we all realize that when this life journey is over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court, we stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the Gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support, enables us to do that. So we thank you and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you. You are the light of the world. 
A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so, your light must shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. Hello and welcome back to Closer Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Baye, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. You are the light of the world. You know what I find very, very dramatic? And for those of you who have not gone recently, and most people don't want to go to church on Holy Saturday, because that's a long one, okay? That's where we do the RCA and welcome people into the church. And you stand outside and they light the new fire and they decorate the candle. But what's interesting is, and to me it's a very dramatic approach, when you say you are the light of the world, first of all, do you understand why Christ was identified as the light of the world? If we go through the Old Testament and we look at their encounter with God, Moses and the law, a burning bush, man in the desert, water from a rock, they didn't quite know exactly who and what God was, they saw the power of God, but they did not know who God was. And so in that promise to send a Savior, now God appears on earth in human form. And so he's referred to as a light to people in darkness. Now, for the people who've been in the dark about who God was, he's now a light. So when we read the sacred scriptures in Mass, and we have the candle right there, that's the light of Christ, learning who Christ was through the scriptures. When you come to the altar, and we have candles on the altar, and where the bread and the wine becomes a precious body and blood of Christ, there's a candle there because he's now the light and becoming Christ for all to receive. And then when we close up the church and we place the reserve uh, sacrament in the tabernacle, there's always a light burning 24-7 to demonstrate and illustrate the presence of Christ in the church, in the Eucharist, in the tabernacle. So when our, our Lord says, you are the light of the world, he means you're the one now who has to bring my presence into the world. You're the one now who has to teach them who God the Father is make his love and make his presence known. There's a wonderful story about a small village in France and during World War II, it was bombed and the, the little parish church was bombed and it was a church of the Sacred Heart and the statue was destroyed. And in the rubble, the people, this, this was a symbol of their community this statue of the Sacred Heart. And they went through the rubble and they were able to find all the pieces of the statue except the hands. They couldn't find the hands of the statue. And so the little parish priest very prophetically said, from now on, you must be the hands of Christ in this community. You'll be the hands. You'll be the ones, the hands that heal, the hands that feed, the hands that touch, the hands who care for the people of this community. And when our Lord asks us to be the light of the world, he means our example needs to be seen. 
not for our glory, not for our glory, but for the glory of God. I can tell you, 45 years into the priesthood, uh, 44 years, I'm sorry, into the priesthood, and having been a parish priest and pastor for a very long time, the most destructive thing in any parish life is when people are looking for recognition as opposed to service. You try doing a ladies' altar society luncheon and forget to put out someone's casserole. God in heaven help us. You will never, ever hear the end of it. You try putting on a parish event and not recognizing every last person who did everything from cut the grass to win the $10,000 raffle. You try doing that and people get very slighted and very hurt. Here's a thought. And, and we're going to read this very soon when we come upon Ash Wednesday. When you pray, go to your room. In the silence of your room, pray and do what you need to do. Fast. You know, don't put on sackcloth and ashes. Wash your face. Put your clothes on. Don't let everyone know you're fasting. Your Father who sees in secret and knows what you do will give you glory. How many of us do it because it's the right thing to do? I don't care if anyone says thank you. I did it for the right reason. Years ago, I was in an inner city parish, and it was really, really, we had Mother Teresa's there, so it was, it was the Mecca for the indigent. I mean, I literally couldn't go from my car to the door without being stopped at least once, and oftentimes more than that, people wanting things. And there one day by myself, people show up at the door, hard luck story, you know, I need to get back to my family. They live an hour away. It's going to cost me $80 for a bus ticket, da 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 You know, and so, you know, I listened and did as much due diligence as I could. And finally, we were out of funds. I took $100 out of my pocket and said, here, go home. Get back with your family. Do everything you need to do. Da 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 da. And a couple hours later, I had to go out. Less than a half a mile away from the rectory, here was my boy. Got his brown bag, and he's he he's on the street, and he's drinking his his bus ticket. I was so angry. I wanted to stop and grab the bottle, smash it on the ground, do whatever. And then I caught myself. You know what? I did that for the love of God. And this guy made a fool out of me. But in the eyes of God, I'm not the fool. He is. The sin is not mine. The sin is his. And I had to let it go. I just had to let it go. And for anyone who knows me, the type A personality that I am, that's not the easiest thing that I do is letting someone swindle me and get over on me and walk away and say, Lord, I did it for you. You take care of the details. And that's really when we become a light to the world. We do the right things because it's the right thing to do. You know, and all of us are stuck with this person in the middle of the busiest intersection in our town, and they're standing there, usually with a brand new pair of sneakers on, but anyway, they're standing there with a, you know, with a sign that says, we'll work for food. 
you know. Oh, good. Can you change my oil while the light is red? I mean, what do you, what kind of work you can do in the middle of a busy intersection? Well, I've gotten to the point that I no longer give out money, but I have some food, a soda, a bottle of water, cheese crackers, an apple. Hey, you need food here. I've seen them throw it on the ground and say, I don't want that, whatever. And I said, you know, that does it. I mean, I'm doing the right thing. I don't want anybody to be hungry. And I'll gladly feed them. But the reality is, is that even if they make us the biggest fool in the world, we're called to do what we do for the love of God and the glory of God. And if it turns out to be a mistake because of the people we're dealing with, we have still done what God asked us to do. And realizing that we become the light of the world when we decide that we prefer to make a difference and not just a living. And you can do both. You can make a, a living and a difference. And it doesn't matter how much your income needs to be. You can make a difference by going down the street to an elderly person and changing a light bulb and bringing the mail from her mailbox to the house that they struggle to get to every day. You don't need to have money to make a difference. What you need to have is an awareness of other people. The ability to look at people and say, they're made in the image and likeness of the same God as me. And anything I can do to make their life better and to serve them is a way of glorifying God. When you talk about the love of God, you talk about it all you want. But as with anything, more is caught than is ever taught. There are people who will learn to imitate your example long before they learn to listen to your words. And that's the invitation for this gospel, to give flavor to the world, to give meaning to the world. We're called to a life of service. It really is not all about me. It's all the people that God has given me to know, to love, and serve for his honor and his glory. Thank you for being with us. May each day bring you close in your walk with the Lord. God bless. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Join us here in this station each week as we strive to bring you the gospel message with great clarity and great charity. And may God bless you in your walk each day.